Yet all the data we've collected, and I have to say, I am shocked. In some cases, the numbers are far worse than I feared. Immersive sports science. Content not commentary, sports science, not bro science. And in this episode, we'll be talking about the controversial Channel 4 program, How to Lose a Stone in 21 Days, which follows five participants who have put weight on during the quarantine coronavirus lockdown in the UK as they attempt to lose their weight. This program is controversial and is currently going through an Ofcom inspection due to 51 complaints being made against the show. That in the first six weeks of lockdown, 16% of us had already put on an extra five pounds. I've run tests on five volunteers to find out how their weight gain has impacted their health. Presented by Dr. Michael Mosley, the show is based upon his two books, The Fast 800 and The 5 to 2 Diet, which is to do with intermittent fasting and VLCDs, or very low-calorie yes, diets. It certainly used to be the accepted wisdom, but there have been a couple of really big studies, one run by Professor Roy Taylor at Newcastle University, another by Professor Susan Jebb at Oxford University, which showed the exact reverse, basically rapid weight loss. Our experiment is inspired by an Oxford University study which my wife Claire helped set up with Professor Jeb. This in turn is also based upon his wife's research and some research from the University of Newcastle. The show followed the traditional structure, the horizon structure meets the kind of game show structure, but more gentle, gentle in approach. They've been comfort eating over the last few months and are suffering from the Corona Kilos, also known as Lockdown Belly. I'm hoping in 21 days' time they will have drastically reduced their weight, shrunk their waist, and through improved nutrition, bolstered their immune systems. The participants were from a varying demographics, all of whom were obese or overweight, and had put weight on over lockdown. The programme was mainly filmed at a social distance in and around Mike Mosley's home, with the exception of the vlogs which were filmed from the point of view and perspectives of the participants in their own environments, as, and explains as to how they were feeling and why they were potentially overweight or obese. I've got my food parcel here. Okay, it's very heavy actually. It's 50 year old Tracy, who's piled on the pounds Thanks to lockdown takeaways. During lockdown, I have put on pretty much going on for a stone and a half. I kind of feel ashamed, really. He's been comfort eating since moving back in with his parents. Being back home, wanting to eat mum's amazing cooking again, and lots of it. I'm not happy with my body, and I'd love to change that. 21 week period, Mike Mosley and his wife performed a battery of health tests and kept in touch with them in order to see if they would maintain the diet they had given them. In my lab, start by measuring your blood sugar levels. Yay! Go! <laughs> this show did really well in finding a wide variety and sources of experts to help expand upon the knowledge Mike Mosley had given throughout the program. There was also some rather dodgy graphics and street experiments performed in order to help explain this further too. And for some reason there was the mass weigh-ins and the usual reality TV tropes, which were rather irrelevant to understanding the scientific information around obesity and how it affects COVID-19. The show was highly controversial. Not just because of the Beyonce style clothing they were wearing. Of course, Beyonce's preferred demographic and market, all the single ladies. All this nose and throat specialist not wearing his mask properly. I mean, come on man, you're a nose and throat specialist. You're within someone's space, looking down their throat. Quite frankly, if you don't wear one properly as a medical professional, you look just silly. For our benefit and your benefit, you're looking down someone's within their two metre space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be asking you for the next few weeks to go on an 800 calorie diet. 
800 calories a day. This is a recreation of my actual facial expression. Okay, it's probably more like this when it I heard it. It obviously offends a lot of people from Beat to Beat who got a 50% uptake from people with eating disorders on a special hotline they set up after these programs have been aired. This is not virtue signaling as per se. They obviously find this highly triggering towards them and increases the chance of them uptaking a diet like this. Even though this diet is exclaimed by Channel 4 is not made for the made for obese and overweight individuals as explained by the research in the area. And as I mentioned before in one of my previous videos, you can see it up there, there's no point just complaining to Beat. Beat can't do anything. If you want something changed, complain to Ofcom. Not an eating disorder charity. They can't make changes towards the television. Although, however comforting it may be and whatever support they may provide. Show how to lose a stone in 21 days. There's a lot of criticism of that sort of drastic cutting down of calories. All sorts of different charities are worried about people with eating disorders. Uh, crash diets, they're also called as well. And actually, that's not really sustainable, isn't it? If you want to try and change someone's lifestyle, losing that much weight that quickly is never going to have a long-term effect because they'll put it on just as quickly when they're tired and bored of it. You clearly it's only appropriate for people who are uh, significantly overweight or obese. Rapid weight loss can be unbelievably effective in the short, the medium and the long term. So there was a study out of uh, Newcastle and out of Glasgow, which showed that type 2 diabetics who were overweight or obese, two years later, uh, they were around seven and a half kilos down. That's um, well over a stone. And they kept it off for a couple of years. Around a third of them had managed to put their diabetes into remission. So the point is that these approaches are novel. They can work, particularly if you offer long term support. I must alliterate that. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not try this at home with out a fitness trainer or about a dietitian notably and or a health professional there to help you through this very low calorie diet or VLCD. VLCDs are often done over short periods of time under high supervision. They take a lot of knowledge for you to be able to achieve and to do it safely. Therefore I recommend you do not try this at home. Do not. For the most part VLCDs aren't particularly healthy. Eating between 800 and 1,000 calories isn't healthy, especially for the average person. Yes, there are caveats to this. The main caveat being that these diets are often designed scientifically for obese people or morbidly obese individuals. Yes, I do realise that if you eat Christmas dinner, for instance, and you eat 800 calories the next day, it's not going to harm you, potentially. But there are ca major caveats with this, so I recommend do not try this at home. However, if you are interested in the science and the information to this, there will be the two journal-articles down below detailing VLCDs. It was an eight-week, 800-calorie diet using real food in patients with type 2 diabetes. It's only suitable for those whose BMI puts them in the overweight or obese category. And if you are a sound mind, and I repeat, uh, if you are sound mind, and are capable to read this information without being triggered, I will link an associate link towards Mike Mosley's books down below. It is important to note the European Union's position stand on this matter being the only position stand we have, and that is that VLCDs, although highly effective, should only be undertaken by specific groups. Now, this is a bit cliche in scientific research, but the major limitation to these studies is that we need a greater body of evidence. There's an argument on the flip side, highly helpful towards people who are obese or put on weight during this period. And these people vastly outweigh, pun not intended, people who are anorexic or who have some form of eating disorder. Therefore, it could be argued that their needs are greater. We must take away from the fact that neither side are trying to virtue signal one another. Well, let's, let's throw that argument out the question because it's not the case in this situation. Often in fitness, we get this messiah complex and you find that a lot with intermittent fasting and intuitive eating. And there's often a war between the two. Intermittent fasting versus intuitive eating. The biggest clash since the beast Eddie Hall 
versus the mountain Hathor Bjornsson. Intuitive eating versus intermittent fasting. Oh, this is dangerous, and oh, this is dangerous, this is better, this... And you find with both that, and you can find this generally across fitness, that people often fall heavily into one and they think it's the best thing ever. They, they can't see any nuance or any caveat. This is the only way to eat. And we know that's not the case. But that's likewise with most things in fitness. Now, if you are interested in my video about this topic, click on the link above here. And likewise, all things to do with fitness, it's related to context. What is the context or the reason why you are eating like this? And the context is king. Context gives us relevance. In terms of intuitive eating, the vast majority of the UK and probably generally of the world eats intuitively. That's because we know we how to eat. We've been taught how to eat, potentially how to eat healthfully, how to know when we're going too far. But a lot of people don't, and that's how they get obese. They they eat whatever they want, whenever they want, and they don't realise they are obese or the damage they're doing to their bodies. On the other hand, intermittent fasting is where you have days of low calories and days of moderately high calories, or you maybe you just eat normally. This and intuitive eating are both acceptably, or let's say, normal ways of eating. It's generally how people generally eat, or should eat, shall I say, in most situations. But likewise, this is where we come down to the nuance and the individual differences. There are certain situations where you wouldn't generally recommend someone to eat a certain way. Anorexics, for instance, you generally want them to try at certain phases to start eating intuitively, to get to know their food, get to love their food, for instance. Telling someone who's morbidly obese to be an intuitive eater for the most part, will probably not work because that's probably how they got obese in the first place, by eating intuitively. Maybe they don't know how to eat intuitively. Maybe they get sugar rusted and have to eat intuitively. And therefore they choose the wrong foods. Maybe they don't know the wrong foods. Maybe they don't have the education around the foods. Maybe they live in a food desert. There's a loads of caveats and I'm not willing to talk about 100% of the caveats in such a small space of time because it'd be inappropriate for me to do so. I wouldn't be able to give the correct depth to do so in such a small space of time. It would be inappropriate for me to do that. And likewise, we're all different. We're all individuals. And what works for one person will not definitely work for another. We're going to take three examples. One from this film, where they utilise mindfulness to get over addiction to eating. Gently placing the object in the mouth. Notice that there may be thoughts around this in your mouth. We can use an example from The Edge, who decided to restrict and cut all his uh, bad trigger food, so to speak. So I'll just stuff myself with all this sort of unhealthy foods. Crisps and the chocolates and the fizzy drinks. And I just sit there and think, oh, this feels great. That starts to build up after a while. That's an addiction. And then you could potentially utilize another example um, from Who Are You Calling Fat? Where they utilize an intuitive style of eating to help someone get over their food addiction. We need to respect that there are different ways of achieving health and fitness goals. And there's a high defense by those who undertake intuitive eating or intermittent fasting or whatever it is. But we must remind ourselves there are different ways of achieving this. That is healthy and that is not crash or fad dieting. Disclaimers are important and just merely talking about it, which is what exactly what they did in this, in my opinion, is not good enough because people often miss it. People often miss the nuance behind something. You can state something, but they don't understand the full depths of the arguments being made and misconstrue what the person is saying. This approach is inspired by long-term studies suitable only for people whose BMI puts them in the overweight or obese categories. Research has found that a short-term 800 to 1,000 calorie diet done with proper supervision has the potential to reverse a range of health problems. This isn't about how to look good in a swimsuit. It's about improving health, 
and the ability to fight off infection. At the beginning of all of this that I'm on the verge of pre-diabetes and it's much more of a motivation than just trying to get into a pair of trousers. You're looking at your kids, you're looking at your husband, you're thinking about everybody and you know I want to be healthy and I want my body to change. I want at the end of this I want all my results to be really good. I don't want to be diabetic. Feelings are valid and yes we shouldn't go out to deliberately kind of abuse people. But nonetheless, the problem with having trigger warnings on everything, especially if there is no f actual mental or physical harm caused by the program, it's just down to whether you like it or not. Where does this end? Especially when people who make judgments about programs without actually watching them. Oh look, a new PewDiePie video. Who is not straight? But wait, PewDiePie is pointing to himself. Well, I'm not going to watch the video. That's all the information I need. PewDiePie is gay. 100% confirmed. Science doesn't lie. It's not manipulative. It doesn't care about your feeling. The people who interpret science lie and can manipulate the facts to their own choosing. Hashtag facts over feelings. And yes, I do realise that is an argument often used by individuals who are deliberately trying to bully people in order to get their opinions across. And that's definitely not in this case. However, if facts breaks your fragile sensibility and you moan about it, your Twitter feed will look like this bloke, which is not a good look. Mike and his wife performed a battery of tests to gauge the health of their client before the show started. This test measures the strength of their lungs. And we know having existing respiratory problems greatly affects your risk of serious complications when it comes to a virus like COVID-19. <gasps> oh, uh... Doing this will reveal whether any of our volunteers have raised blood sugars. Our metabolic rate, the rate we burn calories at rest, tends to slow as we get old. Based on their body mass index and their fat to muscle ratio, this machine will estimate their metabolic age. Okay, I'm not a fan of this machine. It sends an electrostatic signal through the body. If you have more fat mass, then that causes a inhibitor to that electrostatic mass and therefore it's able to calculate how your BMI is and how much fat-free mass you have. BMI has come under some stick recently for not being accurate to certain populations. However, if you are sedentary and obese, it is a good measure. Basically, a BMI of over 30 is considered obese. That is pretty much your waist bigger than your height. A one mile treadmill walk is a very suitable test. Everyone should be able to walk one mile. However, if you wanted to make it less load bearing, you could have used an exercise bike. The body is designed to be able to run three miles in one go. So if you struggle with a one mile walk, that says something about your aerobic capacity. Nonetheless, without being inside a proper lab, you will never be able to gauge completely what these results actually are. Like I really need to focus a bit more on my health and it, this was quite a scary. You find with a lot of obese people, they are scared of fitness environments, especially in times of COVID like this, as they may be at more risk of getting severe complications from COVID-19. They may think also that people will be looking at them, which is completely and utterly preposterous because for the most part, why do fat people go to the gym? For the most part, they're there probably to lose weight. And therefore, they're not out of place. Unfortunately, my nan passed away from COVID. I was comfort eating. I do need Michael's help. Since the gyms have locked down, Yes, there has been an uptake in physical activity and exercise. However, this has been counteracted by the fact that many of us have put kilos on since this break. And sales of junk food, like biscuits, have increased. Personally, I'm not a fan of how they gave them their results. I believe these are probably private matters, even though stated on television. Yes, it makes it look good television, and they do seem sound of mind, although I cannot make that judgment necessarily, because I haven't done a psychological analysis of them. It would be inappropriate for me to do so, and I do not know these individuals personally. We must prevent the sense of humiliation. If you humiliate them, then you effectively lose them throughout the diet. They don't necessarily want to achieve it or fulfil it throughout its full purpose. Reality is that all of you fall into what's called the obese category. All of you have a BMI over 30. Two thirds of British adults are now overweight 
or obese. But in a recent big survey of over 2,000 people, they found that only one in 10 of people who are obese realize they're obese. There appears to be a mismatch. So how good are people at recognizing obesity when it is staring them in the face? We have definitely got fatter over the years, although there were periods where people were malnourished, such as... A London store set out to find Miss Fat and Beautiful, a comfortable woman with the sort of statistics those old Dutch painters would have loved. Hips in the region of the middle 40s and all that. That's practically every Instagram model's booty builder's dream. I'm happy they don't make clothes like that anymore, because that one scares the living crap out of me. Do you think he's... Normal weight, overweight, or obese? Normal weight? Would you be surprised if I told you she's actually obese? <laughs> Obesity has become the norm, with two thirds of Britons now overweight or obese. Warped our perception of normal, and some people are very good at hiding their obesity. As you can see most people are actually pretty bad at recognising obesity, and that's probably because so many of us are overweight or obese. It means there are a lot of people out there who, without knowing it, are actually storing up significant health problems for the future. Seeing models like this can affect a woman's sense of body perception and body image. Yes, there are some genetic anomalies, freaks of nature, so to speak, which can increase the uptake of eating disorders, which led to Cosmo, for instance, banning super thin models and those who have a history of eating or mental health issues. Ironically, they then got Tess Holiday who had an eating disorder and mental health issue to star on the front cover. Now we don't have much evidence to prove whether that obese or seen obese people promotes obesity, although we ha can find anecdotal evidence from the feederism community, or shall I say as they call themselves, stuffers and gainers, that's their words, not mine, where there are a number of examples who feel pressured to look, be big, generally from the praises within their own communities or whether in fact looking at fat models like Tess Holiday, they feel like they need to emulate that person in particular. ...are on less than a thousand calories and they are exercising more so it's crucial they eat the right foods. All foods are made up of macronutrients and all foods have a varying amount of those macronutrients within them and that we should try and avoid processed versions of these macronutrients as they generally tend to be less nutritious and are less healthy for you. Your body rapidly turns highly processed carbs like those in white bread or biscuits into sugars, whereas foods like cauliflower are not only low in carbs but provide fiber, which your body loves. Your body needs protein to do things like build muscle. You get protein from fish and meat, but also many beans and nuts. Your body doesn't store protein for long, so it needs to be constantly topped up. And that way, when they lose weight, they will also preserve their muscle. OK, let's see what a typical day might look like. That is around two and a half thousand calories and a lot less than what many people are eating. The recipes Claire has been sending our contributors work out cheaper than what they would normally eat and would contain not only less calories, but far less carbs and more fibre. If you can shift from this version to this version, uh, it's very good for your mental health, physical health, all sorts of things. So what I want to do is switch you from burning primarily sugar at the moment to burning fat. Uh, then it is a really rapid way to recharge, change things, and what's amazing is within a very short period of time, you'll stop feeling hungry. 800 calories is how a lot of the trials have been done, but I just want to be super safe. So three of you, I'm going to allocate a high protein meal replacement. So, ta-da, this is 800 calories. Wow. So that is one sandwich and a bunch of crisps because you would have this and you'd be starving hungry shortly afterwards and that would not last a day. In fact, the NHS is now beginning to trial rapid weight loss diets with suitable patients. Another major part of this show, other than detailing the diet of the participants, was trying to understand how diet affects COVID-19 and ways to prevent it, especially as we are now coming out of lockdown. Unfortunately, it is the fact that if you are um, significantly overweight, particularly if you're obese, then that will increase the risk if you get COVID-19, that you will end up in hospital. It approximately doubles your risk. One of the things we know about having too much fat around your tummy, so it means the immune system is less effective. 
um, at coping with the virus when you get infected. So obesity roughly doubles your risk of having serious complications. But the problem is it's also tied in with other things like uh, type 2 diabetes or indeed raised blood pressure. And both of those also contribute to your risk. So uh, that's one the way it works. If you have too much fat, particularly around your gut, then that massively increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And if you have type 2 diabetes, that again doubles your risk of having serious complications. So with obesity, one of the things is it reduces your lung capacity. And that means when you end up in intensive care, you need all the oxygen you can get. And the other thing that happens is that when you have a lot of fat, particularly around the gut, it produces these things called inflammatory agents, inflammatory chemicals that travel around your body and induce chronic inflammation. And that undermines your immune system, which means that um, if you get exposed to the virus, you're much more likely to get an infection. A study in which they vaccinated a whole load of people against the flu last winter. And what they found was that if you were a sort of healthy weight, then there was a roughly a 5% failure rate, which isn't bad. But if you were overweight or obese, then it was double that. The vaccine was half as likely to work. And then there is bad inflammation. I think one of the key links is sugar. Obviously, you've got sugar in the form of white granulated sugar, processed sugar. And sugar is something that causes what we call glycolization onto um, some of the cells in our body. Mm. And these things can cause chronic inflammation. Certainly higher body mass index, the higher the risk of having an infection or dying from COVID-19. If you're under 70, by the time you get to the BMI of about 35, 40, your risk is probably three to four fold higher. Body mass index seems to be related, as does clearly age. Roughly speaking, men's risk is usually about 20 to 30 percent higher from dying. But for COVID-19 deaths, it seems to be somewhere around about 80 to 100 percent higher. Actually, more than doubled the normal risk. But certainly, the message is for public health: if people are able to stop weight gain or even potentially sustainably lose two to three kilograms, they may be doing some benefit if they get COVID-19. Well, as obesity, there's been a lot of research suggesting that certain ethnicities seem to be more at risk. Our research provides preliminary evidence that may be the case. Now, just be cautious. Is that cause and effect or is it reflecting other aspects? We just don't know. It might be that partly they are getting more COVID just because of our social you know, cultures and it's harder to socially isolate in our family structures. And it looks like it's about 60%, 50 to 60% higher risk of dying from COVID. India or Pakistan, like myself, or Bangladesh, and it's also for Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans. And then by the time you hit BMI of 25, you've doubled it. And by the time you hit BMI of 35, you're up nearly tenfold. And this is the general score, but if you look at ethnicity, it is much worse. This is basically shows your risk related to ethnicity and also related to your BMI. So this is the risk of admission to hospital, and this is the risk of dying of COVID-19 oh, wow. if you get it. So yeah. this is what happens to white people, and this is what happens to non-white people. I'm already uh, kind of five or six times. Since the UK went into lockdown, we've spent an extra £19 million on biscuits. Tales of alcohol have almost doubled. Of course, naturally healthy food that's highly nutritious and high volume was a major part of this show. Although I'm not too sure about stamping on biscuits. That seemed like it was just trying to make it up just for entertainment purposes. If you leave tempting things on the surface, you just eat them more. The more you pass them, the more you see them, the more you eat them. Out of sight, out of mind really is unbelievably true. It is the first rule of dieting. Get it out the house. I'll gradually reintroduce carbs into their diet, but for now, I'm trying to force their bodies into a state called ketosis. Now, there are around 500 grams of sugar stored in your body, mainly in your liver and in your muscles. There is also around 17 kilos of fat. you're going to have to deplete the sugar stores, the metabolic switch, and move over into fat burning, is that it turns that fat into something called ketone bodies. And then the body and the brain uses those ketone bodies as fuel. You go into what's called a state of ketosis. In a quest to get fit, thought I'd walk the dog. 
Small problem. We haven't got a dog. Oh! I borrowed my friend's dog. During the quarantine, there has been a surge in people doing physical activity and the appreciation of physical activity, possibly due to the effects of what being a beast does when you when you have COVID-19. But there is a disconnect in the fact that we are eating more. It is also known that exercise makes you hungrier as it helps to increase metabolic rate for the short term. Exercises performed in the show were very basic, but very necessary and very applicable to an obese population who are only semi-active. During the lockdown, many places of exercise were closed and people had to improvise with how they exercised. Not everyone was lucky enough to have equipment at home. It's good for anybody and the benefits that someone will get is the, the mind-body connection, basically, and they'll find that their body can do so much more. I am personally not a fan of yoga as a tool to lose weight as it's generally not strenuous enough. You generally don't burn enough calories to do so. But for a morbidly obese person, it will help with their mobility. Often with obese people, their mobility is lacking and it's not particularly too strenuous to do. Also, sedentary people often have very poor core muscles. Your core is your deep underlying muscles in your torso. So it's not necessarily your abs, it's the muscles that are deep within. Generally, they are weaker in sedentary populations. Mike Mosley, from his previous work and previous programs is a big fan of high intensity interval training or HIT training for short. In the old colloquial world we often have HIT which is high intensity interval training and LIST which doesn't exist but the terminology is out there amongst the YouTube community that is low intensity exercise when we're referring to cardio. High intensity interval training or maximal interval training or HIT is periods of intense exercise followed up by short breaks. I would argue what they were doing wasn't HIT training as such because they had long pauses between the intervals themselves. You must take everybody individually. These were generally, I wouldn't say quite fit people, but they had done exercise prior to coming onto these programs. They were mentally strong. They didn't mind doing these exercises because they enjoyed it. And we know that high intensity interval training is not necessarily enjoyable for people who are obese or larger. And nonetheless, there are massive exceptions to this. This is just a generalization. And that you should do the exercise to the intensity the individual needs for their own bodies at that particular time. High intensity interval training for a massively obese person is a perfect way to break their legs. The only thing in their workout that kind of resembled a HIIT training was a 30 seconds on, 30 second to bar to they did. Everything else they did in the workout was general interval training, not HIIT training. Now, if we look at the research by Paddy Akikakis, yes, try saying that after a few beverages, we see that obese people generally find doing activity harder naturally. So them doing high intensity interval training when they're already working at a high intensity anyway, often for them makes the exercise potentially not enjoyable. Yet again, the exercise that they do find enjoyable is only around about three METs, which is a measure they utilize to measure to see how hard an activity is compared to another activity. Now, three METs is like me walking from one end of the corridor to another end. It's not very hard at all and generally and possibly won't necessarily burn those calories off. Gently placing the object in the mouth. Notice that there may be thoughts around this in your mouth. Quite often in films like this, psychology is often seen as an afterthought. And this was one of the major stated limitations with this program. However, I disagree. How would they have known if they needed a wellness coach if they didn't do some form of psychological profiling and case formulation? Shows in the past, like The Biggest Loser, the well-being of the participants was often negatively affected from being on the show. Are you ready to work? Are you ready to work? If you quit on me again, you go home and no one's gonna chase you. No one! Fat affects sleep, especially fat around the neck. And the study suggested if a woman has a neck size more than 16 inches, a man has a neck size more than 17 inches, then you're almost certainly a snorer.
is one of those diseases which is both incredibly common, but it is often missed. And it is so treatable, because if you could just lose a bit of weight, that means the fat will shrink around the neck. Certainly, if you have a partner and they stop breathing during the night for 20 seconds or longer, you need to look into it. I have to say, I didn't really enjoy this documentary as much as I thought I was going to. Lose a Stone in 21 Days follows a group of five individuals as they attempt to lose a stone of weight, often because they may be put on weight during the lockdown period, that in fact they're obese, or they ha are having symptoms from being obese and they don't want to be obese. It follows them as they bring their vlogs, as it shows them how to eat, and also brings out the specific scientific information relating to obesity and how to combat it and why it is important to combat it. The scientific information they gave the participants about themselves was clear, thorough and in-depth. They did not allow room for cognition of the incorrect results by people who are watching this who may misconstrue what they're trying to tell. As a result, their disclaimers could have been a little bit clearer and a little bit more pointed out throughout the actual documentary, especially to those who may have eating disorders. The production value was pretty good, even though they were pretty much spending most of the time around Mike Mosley's house and trying to do this program whilst socially distancing and meeting government guidelines. All in all, I give How to Lose a Stone in 21 Days a KSA score of 99.47.